Chances are you've heard of the Concorde, the supersonic passenger jet that took you from New York to London in just under three hours, cruising at an average speed of twice the speed of sound. Back then, flying on the Concorde was the epitome of luxury and class, ferrying monarchs, heads of state, celebrities, and their very wealthy friends. But less commonly known was the fact that the Concorde wasn't the first supersonic passenger jet built. It wasn't even the first to enter commercial service. That title is held by its older Soviet sister, the Tupolev Tu-144, that flew faster and carried more passengers. Well, technically. But it was eventually unveiled that every person involved, from engineers to pilots to politicians, knew that the plane would eventually fail, but still sent it to the skies anyway. And on the other side of the world, there was also an American Concorde being built by Boeing around a decade later, as if it's the baby of the family trying desperately to catch up to its overachieving older siblings. So in this video, I'll try to paint a portrait of the dysfunctional family of supersonic airliners and why we don't hear much about the forgotten siblings of the Concorde anymore. And I promise you, these are actually pictures of different airplanes. Well, as far as we know. So why did the TU-144 fail despite being the first to fly? And why did the Boeing 2707 project get cancelled despite having a promising prototype and orders from airlines almost doubling that of the Concorde? Well, stay tuned. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a fun and interactive way to brush up on your math and science skills without getting a mountain of textbooks involved, then check out the link in the description. In 1947, Chuck Yeager became the first person to break the sound barrier in a Bell X-1 experimental aircraft, and from that day, it was off to the supersonic races. Throughout the 50s, supersonic fighters like the F-11 Tiger and the F-4 Phantom II began to enter service and gain some popularity, and multiple companies throughout the EU were starting to explore designs for a supersonic passenger jet. But development costs grew so high that it forced multiple companies to collect collaborate on creating a single aircraft, eventually leading to the creation of the Concorde. So decades before the dot-com boom, I guess you could have called the 70s the supersonic boom. But of course, the growing popularity of the still developing Concorde was unsettling news for the American aerospace industry. And in response, the Lockheed Corporation proposed the L-2000 and Boeing the 2707, aka the American Concorde. Of course, the Soviet Union didn't want to fall behind either. This was on top of the already competitive streak it had going with the US, from the race to a spacecraft to who can dig the deepest hole. If you're curious, the Soviet Union won that round. So about a decade after the research for the Concorde began, the USSR started development for the Tupolev Tu-144, also known as the Concorde Ski. So this set the stage for the three supersonic airliners to enter development at the same time, one from the USSR, the EU, and the United States. Despite starting research a decade after the Concorde, the Tupolev Tu-144 became the first supersonic airliner to get off the ground and eventually enter service. But the plane was doomed to fail almost from the beginning, and that was due to a lack of time. The Concorde had almost 15 years for research and development prior to taking flights, whereas the Tupolev engineers were only given five years. And understandably, they had to take some shortcuts to get there. Looking at the Tu-144 next to the Concorde, it's hard to tell them apart. They both have long and narrow fuselage with triangular delta wings optimized for supersonic flights, and a droop nose that lowers during takeoff and landing to improve the pilot's visibility. And this striking similarity has led to even rumors of corporate espionage to steal the Concorde's plans, but of course this is all still unsubstantiated. But if you look closely, there are some differences to tell them apart. For example, the TU-144 had two small retractable mini-wings called mustache canards. These were located just behind the cockpit and increased lift at low speeds. But this wasn't enough to help the aircraft slow down during landing, as the 144 was also also one of the last commercial aircraft to require a braking parachute to land. 
And despite having less powerful engines than the Concorde, the TU-144 had a slightly higher passenger capacity and also a faster top speed, reaching speeds of Mach 2.15 compared to the Concorde's Mach 2.04, but this required its afterburners to be on the entire flight to sustain Mach 2. This not only burned through fuel incredibly quickly, limiting the range of flights, but it didn't make for a very great passenger experience. Due to the afterburners and poor insulation, noise inside of the cabin of the 144 was around 90 decibels, or the equivalent of standing next to a running lawnmower. It was said that passengers had to resort to passing notes to communicate, a far cry from the champagne sipping luxury of the Concorde. So I guess in true Russian fashion, passengers aboard the TU-144 were perpetually freezing and casual conversation sounded like aggressive screaming matches. But oh, the problems of the Konkortsky did not stop there, because you have to understand the aim of the aircraft was not to be a safe and reliable beacon of innovation, oh no, there just simply was not enough time. The TU-144 was designed with one goal in mind, and that was to fly before the Concorde. I mean, they'll just fix the issues later, right? But fly before the Concorde they did, because on the last day of 1968, after just five years of development, the Tupolev TU-144 took off for the first time, beating the maiden flight of the Concorde by just three months. And unlike the large amount of publicity the Concorde received throughout its development, the TU-144 was kept so under wraps during development that had it crashed during its first flights, the Soviets could have simply denied the existence of the plane and and covered it up. What also wasn't publicized at the time was that everybody involved in the project, from the engineers to the government officials, already knew this plane was destined to fail. The issue started even before the plane took off. Prior to its maiden flight, reports had shown that the metal fuselage started to crack at much lower stress levels than was originally designed for at only 70% of the expected flight stress and did not have any designs to stop cracks from spreading. It would also become the only commercial aircraft in history to have ejection seats, but that's only for the crew. Passengers, tough luck. And what a marketing campaign that must have been. Bonk. But jokes aside, despite the unreliability of the aircraft and the suboptimal passenger experience, seats on this very first supersonic airliner were extremely popular. This was largely due to the fact that the communist government did not allow Aeroflot, the only Russian airline operating this aircraft, to charge outlandish ticket prices, unlike the Concorde's average 30-time markup compared to a regular plane ticket. So with the price of just 1.5 times that of a normal ticket, Tickets, demand for seats on the Tupolev far exceeded the single flight per week that Aeroflot ran just between Moscow and Almaty, Kazakhstan. And on top of this, a maximum of only 80 seats was allowed to be booked per each flight, despite the plane's 140 passenger capacity. This was so that if the plane did crash, the damage would be reduced. And there was good reason for this, because early flights indicated that the plane was extremely unreliable. During the 102 flights the TU-144 took over its lifetime, the plane suffered more than 225 failures, and more than 80 of those were in flights. And that's a conservative list. And these failures were often serious enough to cancel or delay the entire flight, which was not great for reliability or timeliness for the airline. And failures included decompression of the cabin during flights, engine exhaust duct overheating resulting in the flight having to return to its takeoff airports, and much more. And it was so bad that Alexei Tupolev, the chief designer of the aircraft, along with two USSR aviation vice ministers, had to be physically present at the airports before each flight to assess the condition of the aircraft and decide fly or no fly. And because of these reasons, of the total 102 flights the aircraft took, only half of them carried passengers, and the rest delivered mail as cargo between cities. Now, I guess if this plane was still around, and well, a lot safer, Amazon might just have a shot at two-hour shipping. Unfortunately, it wasn't long until everyone's worst fear came true. At the 1973 Paris Air Show, the Concorde and the TU-144 flew together for the very first time. But after a success 
successful performance from both planes on the first day, the disaster struck the Tu-144 during its second flight at the show. As the plane was approaching the runway to land, it suddenly accelerated and pulled up into a steep climb. And during this aborted landing, the engines lost power and the plane plummeted to the ground, killing all six crew on board and a further eight on the ground. The cause of this crash was never disclosed to the public, but a popular theory from the USSR was that a French Mirage chase jet was attempting to take pictures of the plane and had gotten too close as the 144 was preparing to land. And the crew on board who weren't aware of this chase plane were surprised and panicked. And another theory from the West suggested that in an attempt to compete with the Concorde, the pilots had pushed the plane past its performance limitations, leading to the overstressed plane breaking down. Some even suggested that the French and English had conspired to leak incorrect blueprints of the Concorde with known design flaws to the Soviets. But at this point, the real cause of the crash may just remain a mystery for the rest of time. Unfortunately, five years later, another 144 crashed in 1978 after catching fire just after taking off in Moscow. Just two weeks later, all passenger service was suspended for the aircraft. Now, the 144 remained as a cargo aircraft until the program was canceled in 1983 due to its unreliability and the rising cost of operation. The aircraft was later used by the Soviet space program to train pilots for the Buran spacecraft, and NASA also used it as a laboratory for high altitude flight testing, and ended up conducting the last flight of the very first supersonic airliner in 1999. Boeing had been experimenting with a supersonic passenger jet since the mid-50s, but it wasn't until the introduction of the Concorde that the project actually had some sense of urgency, especially as airlines in America like Pan Am were considering purchase options, and the hype around supersonic airliners was starting to grow quick. Boeing even had a few competitors in the space, like Lockheed Corporation's CL-823, essentially a larger version of the Concorde. Now, their model didn't have any advanced designs to generate more lift, but instead relied on sheer engine power and longer runways to take off and land, making it extremely noisy. So despite this aircraft being simpler to produce and less risky than the eventual Boeing model, the noise and performance limitations stopped this aircraft from going going past the proposal stage. Originally, the plane had a design goal of carrying 300 passengers with a top speed of Mach 3, and the key features engineers came up with to accomplish this was a swing wing configuration, where the wing could pivot backwards to be more efficient during supersonic flights. But during development, the weight and size of this system continued to grow, until engineers were forced to abandon this idea altogether and start over with a delta wing. The wings were also designed with advanced high lift devices to minimize the amount of thrust they required, and hence the noise that was generated during takeoff. And aside from its supersonic aspirations, the 2707 was remarkable in its own right, being one of the earliest planes with a wide body design with the 232 row seating arrangement that's commonly seen today. And the excitement grew so much around this unfinished plane that Boeing had 115 orders from 25 airlines, even more popular than the Concorde, which at its peak had 74 orders. But as it turns out, this still wasn't enough, because in the late 60s, after the flights of the Concorde and the Tu-144, it was almost as if the supersonic dream becoming a reality shattered the bubble for a lot of people, because they began to complain about the noise pollution from sonic booms, which were explosion-like sounds that could be heard from 16 miles away and shattered windows and damaged buildings. Environmentalists also grew concerned about the impact that these jets were making on global warming, especially emitting large amounts of nitrogen oxide through its exhaust at very high altitudes. But perhaps the final nail in the coffin was that the economics of supersonic airliners was becoming less and less appealing, because while initially they had an edge by serving the role of two to three airliners like the 707 with limited passenger capacity, with the development of the 747 and the A380, supersonic airliners no longer had the speed and fuel advantages. So with all of the cars now being stacked against supersonic airliners, Congress decided to drop funding for the project in 
1971 and also banned all commercial supersonic flights over the US, essentially marking the end of the Boeing 2707. In the end, two prototypes were built, but the plane was never flown. So perhaps if Boeing had started just a few years earlier on this project, the world of civil aviation might look very different today. So that was a walkthrough of the glorious decades of supersonic passenger flights, and we might actually be picking up where we've left off in the past, because after all of the technological advancements we've made in the last few decades, companies are starting to explore supersonic airliners once again, but this time without the downfalls, like NASA's X-59 quiet supersonic research aircraft that's designed to reduce the noise of supersonic boom. So who knows, maybe there are many more Concorde 2s and Concorde 3s to come in the future. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for new content like this. And in the meantime, if you're looking for a way to make supersonic flight a little less intimidating, a great resource I'd recommend is Brilliant. It's an interactive learning platform for topics in math, science, and engineering. And if planes is your jam, which I'm assuming it is as you made it through this entire video, I'd highly recommend their classical mechanics course, whether you're an absolute beginner or a seasoned scientist. I'm still learning so much and realizing just how much I've forgotten from school. But more importantly, these lessons feel like I'm playing a game and not doing work, while learning physics is just another plus. They have super interesting examples of how concepts actually apply in real life and quizzes to bring out your inner perfectionist as well. To learn more about Brilliance, go to brilliant.org forward slash Jenny Ma and you can try it out completely free. And if you like what you see, they're kindly offering a 20% discount off their annual plan for our viewers as well. So that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time.